So Zechariah is what we would call, if Zechariah were sitting out in the congregation today, we would point to Zechariah and say, there's a godly, mature believer. That's who Zechariah was. But as we see in this passage, Zechariah still had room to grow. And mature Christians, any of us who consider ourselves mature Christians, need to learn from this that we can't coast in our faith. Because there's always room to grow. There's always room to learn more about God and about what it means to walk with God and about what it means to trust God. People who have walked with the Lord for a long time still need to grow. So let's never quit pursuing God. Let's never quit trusting Him. And what a joy it is for me to see senior saints who, who are still studying God's word hard and who are still obeying and serving and learning and changing as they see God moving. But for now, let's remember that Zechariah doubted God. And because of this lack of faith, uh, the Lord's angel says that Zechariah would not be able to speak until this promised baby boy was born. Well, almost a year goes by. Zechariah gets released from his duties, and um, Elizabeth becomes pregnant. And after nine months, she gives birth to a boy, and there's a great celebration. During this whole time, though, uh, of waiting, Zechariah hasn't spoken a word. And, and somebody in and the first service pointed out to me, um, actually Susan Achenbach, who does the signing, pointed out to me, I think it's in verse 62, that when the baby was born, the people were signing to Zechariah. So I think they thought he'd lost his hearing because he wasn't uh, speaking. So they were signing to him that they wanted to name the boy John. I I'm sorry. They wanted to name the baby boy Zachariah after him, after his father, in honor of the father. But Zachar uh, Zachariah grabbed the, uh, a tablet and wrote down on it, his name is John, because that's what the angel said. And scripture says immediately, Zechariah started speaking. He hasn't spoken now for a year. Can you imagine not being able to speak for a year? And what's the first thing that Zechariah does? He starts praising God. In Luke chapter 1, verse 67, we're told that Zechariah began to speak after almost a year of silence, and he began praising God. The Holy Spirit at that moment um, fills him and inspires him and he sings this song of praise to God for the sending of the Savior. And Zechariah, what he does in this long song is he paints four beautiful pictures of what the coming of the Savior is going to mean to us. And so we are going to look at that now. I would encourage you, if you could find your sermon outlines printed in the back of your um, bulletin, we're going to look at these four pictures that Zechariah, John the Baptist's father, paints to tell us what it's going to mean to us that the Savior has, is coming and will be born. Now, before we look at these four things, let me just ask you this to kind of get you ready for this. What does salvation mean to you? What does your salvation, what does the fact that Jesus has forgiven your sin and made you right before God what does that mean to you? How do you, how do you think about that? And how do you tell others what that salvation means? What, what images do you use to, to describe and, and express your, your salvation, your relationship with God? Well, here are four ways. There's, there's many, many ways. Here are four ways that God gives to us through Zechariah. First, Jesus coming for us is like the opening of a prison. It's like the opening of a prison. This image is painted by Zechariah in um, verse 68, where Zechariah says, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, who has redeemed his people. The key word there is redeemed. That word redeemed means to set free by paying a price. It refers to either the releasing of a prisoner or the liberating of a slave. And so right away in this song, Zechariah paints a, a beautiful word picture of what it means to have salvation. It's, it's the liberation uh, of, a, of a prisoner from a cell.
And so what we celebrate with our salvation is we celebrate that once we were slaves to sin, once we were in bondage, once we were in prison, but Jesus coming has opened that door and set us free. Diedrich Bonhoeffer, a Christian pastor who was imprisoned by Hitler during World War II, he wrote this to his fiance about a lesson he learned about being a prisoner. And he said this. He said, A prison cell in which one waits, hopes, does various unessential things, and is completely dependent on the fact that the door of freedom has to be opened from the outside is not a bad picture of Advent. A person in prison hopes and waits and depends on someone else to open that prison door. That's a, not a bad picture of Advent, of Jesus coming. That's what it means for Jesus to come. I, I've, I'm assuming that very few of you have been prisoners. That very few of you have been confined and not free to go wherever you want to go and do whatever you want to do. But if you can imagine being imprisoned and then having that door opened and you you being told you can go free. That's one image of what it means to be forgiven, to have a Savior come. The next image that Jesus, that, that Zacharias gives about Jesus coming for us is that Jesus coming for us is like the winning of a battle. It's like the winning of a battle. And we see this picture painted in verses 69 through 75. In these verses, Zechariah talks about a horn of salvation. And this horn of salvation uh, symbolized power and victory in war. It, it was making reference to a bull's horn and the power uh, of a bull in battle. In the previous picture, I think it's interesting that the captives were set free. The prison door was open. But in this picture, the enemy is defeated so the enemy cannot capture any more prisoners. It's like it's another step. It's another celebration. So when we celebrate our Savior, we're celebrating that the enemy has been defeated. That Jesus came and on the cross, Jesus defeated our enemies of sin, death, and hell. The grave. If Jesus is your Savior, if you've acknowledged your sin and acknowledged that Jesus is the only one that can forgive you through his work on the cross, then you're on the winning side of the battle of the universe. And so think about any, any victory that you've ever won, any sports team you've ever been on, and any greatest victory you've, you've ever experienced. Maybe you've actually been in war, in battle. Whatever, you, maybe you fought alcoholism. Whatever it is, whatever battle that you've ever experienced a victory in, imagine that and multiply it times winning the battle of the universe. You're on the side, if Jesus is your Savior, of the victors of the universe.